Thank you. Uh, so the title is as follows, yes? And uh, here uh, I would like to present my co-authors because <coughs> this investigation was partly founded by Quantum Gravity Research <coughs> Company. And uh, uh, here is uh, the representatives, Clearin and Rasgris. And uh, most of the, the experimental work was done in the Kharkov Institute of Physics and Technology. Uh, by these two guys, Alexei Dmitmirenko and Valery uh, Berisenko. So, uh, I actually started doing this um, research of Lenar approximately three years ago as a theorist. And uh, some of you maybe remember my <coughs> presentation in Padua in 2015. And uh, then, Mm, I realized at some point uh, that uh, more experimental evidence <coughs> is needed, maybe, and uh, um, with some <coughs> funding it's probably po po possible to organize such uh, experiments. Uh, and so we <coughs> actually um, try to replicate uh, to <coughs> some experiments done before. And also, we will try and are trying uh, to test some new materials that we are now making. Prehistory. Uh, I was a witness myself yeah, of this experimental testing uh, made actually in the garage yeah, in Kiev. And the author of this uh, installation was Nika Seika, a very talented engineer. Um, and he actually tried to replicate Parhomov's results and uh, <clears throat> seemed to be very successful. Uh, he mod modern modernized, uh, improved, let's say, the, um, the logistic of experiment, to my mind, in, in a sense that uh, he directly measured the produced, uh, produced energy. How? Uh, uh, here's reaction chamber, let's say, yeah? It's a quartz tube with some thermal insulation. And the ceramic tube is inserted inside. Uh, then uh, you heat it, electric heating, alternating just from the network. And uh, your PID system keeps the temperature constant. And then you just measure how much energy is absorbed uh, to keep this temperature. And just before my eyes, uh, he produced uh, <coughs> this result, uh, taking a test, testing tube with just pure nickel. And it was 150 watts. Uh, this, there were some deviations, plus, minus. Minus 10, plus 10, but the mean <coughs> number was something like 180. Then he took, took out this one and inserted another one with the fuel, with the mixture, with this aluminite hydride. And uh, in a few minutes, when the temperature again <coughs> settled at uh, this level, uh, we saw and I saw and took these pictures. You see, it was just you know unprepared, etc. And then the the <coughs> readings was like 138, 140. So the 40 watt difference, and um, okay, I've been ob observing it about maybe five minutes or so, and he claimed that he could do it for four hours, but apparently it looked like very <coughs> good evidence of uh, that something happening um, that cannot be explained by uh, any uh, chemical process. However, uh, some months after that, uh, the results couldn't be replicated. And uh, during a couple of um, next visits uh, to his lab, he moved from the garage to the lab, and we tried together again to do the, the trick <coughs> with no success. Uh, the only things uh, that uh, could, could be <laughs> reproduced was something like this, the failure of equipment, okay? Uh, and uh, that's why <coughs> I thought that it would be good to to make the uh, experimental tests 
in a more controlled way. And uh, now we have this <coughs> opportunity. And I would like to present you uh, <coughs> two of such uh, experiments. One is uh, <coughs> interaction of nickel powder with hydrogen and uh, <coughs> lithium aluminum uh, hydride uh, under heating and also under gamma irradiation, uh, combined action. And another one will be new material that we try to test, uh, which is a melt span amorphous LA niodymium theorem. Uh, also, we tried it <coughs> with uh, hydrogen, deuterium, atmosphere, also under heating and uh, under irradiation. Uh, <coughs> here are the schematics of our installation. It's mostly tubes. Yeah? <coughs> Inside is a ceramic tube with a fuel. And uh, there's another tube with a heater. Its coils goes in th this way. Uh, and there's a molybdenum foil which mm, provides more um, homogeneous heating, let's say. And uh, here is one of the thermocouples, uh, which measures directly the temperature on the heater. In other thermocouples, T1 measures the temperature inside the fuel. And uh, in the first installation, there was another one, uh, <coughs> the third one, which measures the temperature outside, just uh, the outside the, the, the outer tube, let's say. And uh, we have the possibility to change the gases and uh, hydrogen, deuterium, also argon, for comparison, uh, make more or less good vacuum system. And the idea is, first of all, that <coughs> when you do just a calorimetry, you just play with some output, input, actually numbers. But, but when you measure these two temperatures, then, and if you see that the temperature inside the fuel is higher than the, the temperature directly at the heater, the only reason behind that could be the production of some <coughs> thumb, uh, extra heat, okay? Uh, that's how <coughs> uh, installation looks. And uh, also, it's uh, underground. Uh, and also, uh, we have um, one the graph a linear electron accelerator at our d disposal with energy of the beam up to 3 MeV. And uh, using some metallic converters, for instance, we use tantalum, it is possible to uh, convert electrons to gamma rays <coughs> and uh, irradiate the sample with gammas. Uh, <coughs> Here the scheme showing the <coughs> uh, Bram uh, Stalung yeah? uh, gamma quanta produced <coughs> at the tantalum converter. For instance, if you're using 3 MeV, you produce this kind of spectrum. If you use 1 MeV, this time of oh, spectrum. And the idea is that if you irradiate um, uh, directly with electrons, then you, you heat also very hot. And besides, you may produce some defects. Uh, while gammas uh, <coughs> make more, mm, <coughs> uh, more subtle effect on the material, they just, let's say, shake atoms around the equilibrium positions. And in our mythology, that could produce some, <coughs> some interesting effects. OK. Uh, that's how <coughs> this specimen looked in the uh, scanning electron microscope. Uh, we tried two brands so far of nickel. This I call nickel asega uh, because it's uh, the name of the uh, uh, the uh, nickel asega actually, and uh, we actually don't know <coughs> the method in which this powder was produced, but we we, we see that. Um, it, it, have, it has a very well developed surface of the order of uh, 100 nanometers. And uh, another one uh, provided by Alan Smith uh, from the UK, this is a nickel archer. Uh, it looks like a little bit more <coughs> fine, but the closer look shows that uh, their surfaces are <coughs> more or less similar. And so the first experiment was just to 
to derive the basic interaction of nickel with hydrogen, without lithium or aluminum, etc. Yeah? And uh, <clears throat> here's the time, here's the temperature. Uh, and the experiment, uh, the the nickel was pre preconditions, let's say, <clears throat> to get rid of um, possible oxygen layers, etc. And then for for a day or two. And then you see the, the, the red line is <clears throat> the red line is um, the temperature of the heater, and the black line uh, curve is the temperature of the fuel. <clears throat> and uh, here you see that it's below. Then it starts a little bit higher. Uh, then we change the uh, low the temperature, low the energy input. Here's the energy input. Uh, and then make it a constant. And uh, here you may see that as if the temperature of the fuel uh, starts to be higher than the temperature of the heater. Uh, but alas, it's an artifact because <clears throat> you see the input is uh, constant and the temperature of the heater is decreasing slowly but more um, but more fast than the, 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 the temperature, no, actually not the temperature, the readings of the thermocouples. It's a K-type thermocouples, nickel alu aluminum. Uh, so that, that was some of the warning that uh, in, in spite of the apparent <coughs> logistic of the experiment, you know, these are artifact dangers always that should be taken into account. And uh, then in another try, when we already <coughs> tried to, ah yeah, uh, a few words about this uh, experiment, but uh, at this stage we also tried to apply this <coughs> gamma ir irradiation. But as you can see, it resulted only in the, in the small heating peaks, uh, but it didn't change the, <coughs> the, the order of the temperatures. So. Uh, it, it means that both fuel and the heater uh, was slightly heated by the gammas. <coughs> so uh, uh, we didn't expect much actually at this <coughs> range of temperatures for some reasons that I probably will tell you on Thursday when I <coughs> will explain our background, theoretical background. Yeah. So <coughs> in the second try, we, uh, second set, set up. Uh, we okay. We we used nickel mixed with uh, <coughs> hydride, and uh, then some <coughs> surprising uh, things start happening. Uh, already after maybe seven, eight hundred of C, you see that the <coughs> readings or okay temperature of fuel uh, started <coughs> started exceed exceeding that of the heater. And when we decrease the input power, the difference between also decreased. Then repeated almost the same. So the maximum difference was uh, around 100, say. And um, when we stabilized the input power, uh, it, 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 it lasted uh, for, uh, for, for uh, <coughs> approximately four days. And uh, uh, if <coughs> the estimate of the excess heat, if it was produced by this temperature difference, w would be produced <coughs> by excess heat, uh, then it would be of the order of um, one megajoule, and which was probably two orders of magnitude larger than uh, the, the all the energy <coughs> produced by burning of the present hydrogen. But, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that in this setup we used different type of a thermocouple, tungsten rhenium, and uh, we calibrated it before in the pure uh, um, hydrogen, and it is known to be very resistant, therm thermal resistant, yeah? And in a pure hydrogen it behaved very well, <coughs> well above a uh, thousand say. Uh, but we did Another check with two types of uh, thermocouples integrated inside the fuel. So <coughs> then you, you see red one, it's the readings of the heater, and this 
blue and um, bl uh, blue is the K type. Uh, Hamel alumel and the tungsten rhenium is, is the black one. Quite surprisingly, after the same temperature, it started deviating, but not up, not above, but below. Yeah, and so if it could be truth that one could say, okay, we have not the energy production, but energy consumption, <laughs> but alas. You can see that another thermocouple doesn't show any sign of unusual behavior, okay? Uh, so, uh, in discussion uh, of this setup, it could be said that uh, it looks like uh, these <coughs> tungsten linear thermocouples uh, interacts uh, with <coughs> material, uh, which results in either higher or lower readings of the temperature. And the most surprising is that the outcome is unpredictable. Uh, why uh, <coughs> it responds differently to the same environment is um, unclear for us for the moment. Yeah? Of course, one could speculate, for instance, uh, I'm here citing this Daniel Sumsky, that both endothermal and uh, exothermal nuclear reactions can occur, and uh, the pre predominance of one or uh, other actually <coughs> uh, tells you <coughs> what is going on. But uh, in our case, we clearly see that the second thermocouple didn't show any response to the reaction, and probably it indicates the artifact of the mm, installation. Uh, in the second round, what I would like to to discuss now. We try the interaction, interaction of this uh, Melspan <coughs> produced by Melspan <coughs> niodymium theorem. Uh, with hydrogen and deuterium, I will show only hydrogen experiments because <coughs> deuterium uh, interaction was more or less <coughs> similar. Uh, well, motivation here, uh, I will tell again on Thursday uh, in my theoretical lecture. Mm, but in a nutshell, it's based on the um, earlier finding uh, some, you know, <coughs> three years ago, Professor <coughs> Francesca Piazza uh, uh, from France uh, attracted my attention to the fact that when you <laughs> model uh, the excitation of nonlinear vibrations in uh, disordered uh, structures, for instance, here is the protein structures, yeah, it even look amorphous, yeah, then it appears that the disorder helps to ignite, excite the nonlinear <coughs> oscillations of uh, atoms at the same places every time. Uh, so disorder helps, and maybe, maybe there's some clue to the uh, <coughs> statement by storms that cracks and small particles are yin and yang of the cold fusion environment. So maybe these uh, nuclear active places somehow related to these <coughs> nonlinear vibrations which like some disorder. Okay, So we try to produce really disordered structure by this melt spawn, this is how it looks. Uh, it also has <coughs> very well developed surface and uh, the structure <coughs> kind of this type uh, amorphous phase, <coughs> you know, with this combination, with two uh, subphases. And uh, uh, X-ray diffraction study of three types of material produced in different years, yeah, starting uh, eight years ago, six years ago, and presently produced different fringes indicating that this one has a more or less half of amorphous uh, structure against the <coughs> crystalline, and the the most fresh one pr uh, contained uh, approximately 90% of amorphous stage, and <coughs> uh, intermediate 80%. And uh, these two actually <coughs> uh, materials uh, reacted differently to the uh, to the hydrogen uh, under heating. Here is one example, very characteristic of interaction between the <coughs> hydrogen. Uh, um, this is the time, this is the temperature, yeah? And uh, 
Uh, blue one is a <coughs> hydrogen pressure inside the, the chamber. Uh, you see we start uh, slightly above three atmospheres, three bars. And uh, these two are, again, the, <coughs> the black one. Uh, the black one is a temperature outside the chamber, outside the ceramic tube. And uh, uh, the red one is the temperature inside <coughs> the material. So this is slow heating, uh, nothing happens, and then suddenly, very suddenly, uh, almost all the hydrogen in the system is sucked, absorbed by the material. <coughs> we have this, you know, two grams of material, which is actually wrapped in the cup of oil to protect the chamber. Yeah, and um, uh, also, um, yeah, uh, <coughs> examination of the amount of um, absorbed uh, hydrogen uh, shows that uh, the, it's more than 1%, 1.3% 1 uh, of hydrogen, uh, which is actually more than 100% uh, yeah, of <coughs> in atomic ratio. Yeah, and you see that it's instant heating, very strong one. And uh, it's so strong that uh, everything melts. Uh, it's, it's before, it's after. Yeah? So then, <coughs> of course, the structure is destroyed. And uh, after taste, after taste analysis shows that, OK, no, uh, there are some crystalline phases, <coughs> hydride phases. Yeah? Uh, what is <coughs> surprising is that uh, we tried the same material to analyze in the different scanning calorimeter. And here in a hot atmosphere, you can, you can see, for instance, the, the, the heat of amorphous to crystalline conversion is negligibly small. So it can be explained by this. And also, you see the experiment in a uh, hydrogen flow. And uh, you may calculate uh, the heat produced. And then when you compare these two figures, uh, you find that uh, in, the, in this big experiment, let's say, <coughs> we produced uh, almost uh, eight, um, 80 kilojoules per gram of um, hydrogen, while in the DEC experiment it was <coughs> 11. So <coughs> eight times more was produced here. It's an estimate, of course, but um, <coughs> The reason of this discrepancy um, is unclear. We can only say some <coughs> kind of hypothesis that this hydrogenation of this amorphous uh, phase, yeah, <coughs> it results in the formation of nonlinear vibrations, yeah. Uh, this story will be later told to you. And this uh, catalyzes <coughs> LNR. LNR produces heat, and heat melts the structure, which kills and stop the reaction. So uh, what is to be done is try to sl slow it down by, for instance, mixing it with co 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 copper powder. We did that, produced very, very weak effect, uh, lasting um, <coughs> so 40, 40, 40 minutes instead of uh, 40 seconds. But again, the energy production was less. So <coughs> in this particular example, it was uh, the feedback, positive feedback, wasn't sufficient to ignite the reaction uh, that <coughs> we were looking after. Uh, well, <coughs> so conclusion uh, to this experiment that uh, some heat is produced, uh, <coughs> and uh, we call it abnormal heat. But whether it uh, has a relation to linear, uh, we don't know. And the general conclusion is like follows, that uh, we now have this experimental setup that allows accurate measuring of these parameters controlling the reaction. First, pressure, temperature inside fuel, temperature at the heater. The difference can be provide some direct evidence <coughs> of, of what's going on. Uh, also, we can <coughs> supply some uh, uh, further driving, both electromagnetic with magnets, etc., and radiation induced. And uh, the first tests uh, indicate that <coughs> the experiments with lithium hydride uh, <coughs> should, should be continued b because so far we, in, we are encountered with some artifacts uh, and in some other experiments, uh, materials will be and are actually <coughs> synthesized 
uh, now in and other types of installations uh, that we have at our disposal, like for instance ele electron beam melting. And uh, what promising is this titanium, zirconium, nickel, but this is a future story. Uh, the results are published <coughs> in some papers, <coughs> refereed ones. And, uh, and this, <coughs> thank you for your attention. interaction of the gamma rays, gamma radiation, with uh, uh, alloys, uh, with a fuel. Yes. And what's the result? Uh, I don't uh, understand uh, your conclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, why you use this X radiation? Why? Mm -hmm. And then, what's the main result of this experiment? Uh, mm, yeah, uh, it's a good question because, um, in principle, if my theoretical talk would be the first and this one the second, probably this question would have been asked, yeah? <laughs> because it's, it's the correct, motivation but... goes from the theory, yeah? And in a nutshell, our theoretical uh, concept is that uh, linear could be <coughs> mediated by localized vibrations of atoms. Okay, uh, this is uh, a new uh, field for <coughs> for many of us. Yeah, but in principle, what is it? Uh, it, it's caused by uh, large displacement of atoms from their equilibrium positions. Okay, temperature can do that, but temperature can do that um, when you heat the, the, the sample, as we are heating, for instance. Yeah? Occasionally, by fluctuations. There is uh, <coughs> formation of such spots, but if you try to do it deliberately, then you may be more successful. What is deliberately? Uh, in our view, when you uh, irradiate it with gamma, then you push atoms. Gamma is con con converted to electrons by photo effect of the same energies. Yeah? And when the energy is in the KV region, it's just enough to push an atom, and it starts in our slate. Then I will show you. Oh, stop, 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 stop. Later. Uh, <laughs> because of uh, electron beam plasma, the plasma, it's not uh, uh, X-ray uh, radiation. Okay. Uh, it's electron beam interact with the, uh, your uh, sample. Mm -hmm. And so we have a very complex situation with, with the creation of secondary electrons, uh, plasma, and no, no, no. it's only one component of this complex experiment. Here only gammas in, uh, interact with the fuel. Now, electron beam we, we direct at the tantalon converter, converter. And from it, all, only gammas enter the material. So, and inside the material, of course, you're right, there's a chain of... Uh, there is gamma pressure before tantalium, so <coughs> I think it's correct. And so the idea was to see the energetic effect of electron, electron, electron beam interaction is a very complex process. Uh, I know. And, uh, it's, it's, it's not very good, simple. Uh, I agree. Explanation. No, you're simple. Um, people sometimes do experiments with um, metals and hydrogen. Hello? Can you hear me? People sometimes do experiments with metals and hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So, for example, years ago we would put into a hydrogen atmosphere pieces of palladium or nickel or vanadium and so forth. And initially at low temperature there would be no absorption. And then as we raise the temperature, we would burn off the oxide layer, and then there would be very sudden absorption, the pressure would go down. Mm -hmm. um, people also do this kind of experiments even these days, I think, with uh, smaller particles, and even nanoparticles, and observe a sudden pressure drop. Now, if the hydrogen going into the uh, powder or dust or nanoparticle, uh, if it goes down, and um, drops down in energy, then if it goes down into a well, then the excess energy shows up as, as heat. Mm -hmm. So what some people see is that when the hydrogen gets absorbed, the temperature goes up uh, transiently, and it can go up a few hundred degrees. A, a well for hydrogen might be a quarter of an electron volt 
or, or even half electron volt, depending on, on the, what the well looks like. So the, looking at your data, um, one, uh, again, I, I don't know much about your experiment. I'm trying to learn about your experiment. But one interpretation might be, as you raise the temperature, um, you have an oxide layer on the surface of your neodymium iron um, amorphous uh, alloy. Uh, when the temperature gets high enough, you burn off the oxide layer enough to permit uh, hydrogen going into your alloy. Then it goes in, gets absorbed suddenly, your pressure drops. And if it goes down into a well, then the temperature would go up. And so the question I'm wondering is whether um, whether that picture might account for the uh, temperature effect that you're seeing. Well, uh, actually, uh, <coughs> we did some experiments with pre um, prehydration, let's say. Uh, so we tried to get rid of the oxygen uh, before actually the experiment. Yeah. To know that, yeah. Actually, one good point that you raised is that we uh, did experiments with nickel. Uh, one frustrating thing was that we never um, uh, we never were able to to, uh, to 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 make nickel absorb a good amount of hydrogen. The, the maximum uh, was some a few percent, not big percent, but few atomic percent. This, and the uh, this guy absorbs uh, very good. The, the solubility of hydrogen in bulk nickel is very, very small. Yes. So you, you need either defects or impurities or something. Oh, impurities, yeah. So now we're also um, <coughs> trying uh, making a palladium coating, etc. So, and that's why in parallel we tried with this kind of material and uh, also this uh, nickel zirconium titanium one, for instance, it already shows. Uh, that it can absorb uh, a lot, a lot already at room temperature, but it's a kind of different story. But here, I I'm more or less positive that this effect wasn't due to the coating or something. It's, it's just the temperature range with the really uh, very fast uh, uh, absorption. That some reactions, uh, chemical reaction, of course, uh, starts. But um, it might be that this uh, <coughs> chemical reaction ignites something more powerful, and this more powerful kills. Uh, it's follow, let's say, and everything stops. So <laughs> the idea is how to make it controllable, and we still don't know the answer. Okay. So thanks. I think the session closed. So take off and drink. Thank you.